Hello, welcome. Um, thank you everybody for joining us in this uh, Zoom session, the first session of our sustainability sessions. So my name is Vanessa Norwood and I'm Creative Director of the Building Centre and we're open. We're here in the building in real life, or I, I am here rather, um, Peter and Cass are separated from me. The building is open to the public now, so do join us at the Building Centre. Come and have a coffee and see our conversations about climate change exhibition with the Timber Trade Federation. Um, hoping that lots more of you will come and join us soon because it's actually really quite exciting to be back in central London. So today I'm very pleased to welcome Peter Laidler and uh, we're also joined by Cassian Castle and they're going to be talking about an award-winning project, uh, Yorkton Workshops. It won Retrofit of the Year 2021, the AJ Award. The sustainability sessions are our new series and throughout the summer we're going to be exploring aspects of sustainability in the built environment. And this first series and this first talk celebrates retrofit projects that aim to reduce carbon emissions while giving existing buildings new life. Uh, so Yorkton Workshops, award-winning, great project. Uh, it's going to, you're going to learn a lot more about the project from Peter and Cass. So Peter Laidler, uh, founder and director of the Engineering Design Studio Structure Workshop. Since its inception in 2004, the company has worked with many award-winning architects and designers. And we're going to be learning a lot more about the practices response to the climate emergency and the practice is committed to minimizing upfront carbon and maximizing material utilization in structural design. Uh, Cassian Castle graduated from the RCA in 1999, qualified as an architect in 2001, founding Cassian Castle Architects in 2006. So based in North London, where I presume you are now Cass, the practice specializes in retrofit projects and one-off new builds and has received numerous awards and accolades over the years. So today we're learning more about the York Yorkton Workshops, which was a project in association with the client design firm P Pearson Lloyd. So I will hand over to Cass and Peter, who will be giving the presentation together. Yeah, so thank you for joining us everybody at home and in your offices. You can ask questions of Peter and Cass through the Q&A option on Zoom and I'll be keeping an eye out for those. So thanks Cass and thanks Peter for joining us in this technical realm that is Zoom. So I hope to actually meet you in person, but for now over to you, thank you. Thanks Vanessa. Thanks very much Vanessa. Um, so um, my name's Cass Castle um, and this is Pete. Um, <laughs> Good afternoon. I'll start talking about the project. Do you want, do you want to um, start sharing the screen? Yeah. Uh, so let me know when you can see that, Cass. Yep, I can see that. Okay. So, <clears throat> so this is Yorkton Workshops. Uh, we completed it last year. It's a project for Pearson Lloyd, who are a design firm. Um, and they, it was a, it's a, they had a, numerous uh, properties around London. It's a chance for them to bring it all together. So it's offices, workshops, studios, meeting rooms, and a, a gallery space. It's a kind of a creative hub for them. Um, I'll come back onto them in a minute. It's, um, it's a one AJ retrofit of the year this year, which was thrilling. Um, and, uh, just wanted to show you some of the finished product first of all, but actually before we do that, there's a picture of the, before the next slide, that's, this is the building as it was before. Um, so as you can see, there's not much going for it. Reasonable for smart on the street, but the rest of it's kind of a hodgepodge. Um, and the process of design was a process of uncovering and discovery and archeology span of the existing building to find what could be kept and what could be got rid of, which Pete's going to talk about a bit more. But I'm just going to show you some of the finished products, first of all. Um, so yeah, this is what we carved out of that hodgepodge um, by careful selection uh, of the elements. 
Um, and for us, the, the real enjoyment of the project was to, um, to work with the existing and to create internal spaces which felt uh, had a richness to them because of the um, the next slide, Pete. Um, because of the way that the new is juxtaposed with the old. So all, all the way through the building, there are old elements and new elements. Uh, and we've sort of created, well, we, what we've tried to do is create a kind of harmony between them. But all the time, the, the, each of the spaces have a real richness because of the, the next slide because of the, um, because of that history that's apparent um, every turn. So we, this is um, some interior shots showing reclaimed floorboards, existing brickwork prepared. Um, next. Yeah, and then we just pause there for a sec. This is a, obviously an old bit of brickwork which we put a new ceiling in, um, which I think sort of really uh, typifies the whole the idea of the whole project there. Um, just wanted to talk a bit about the design team, uh, which was actually critical to the success of the project. Um, I, I was the architect and also the, the main contractor, unusually, um, which we could talk a bit more about later. Um, Pete is an engineer who I've worked with over the last 15 or 20 years on many, many projects. Uh, the next slide is a picture of one such project that we did together in Brighton. It's a retrofit that shows the before and after, so quite a radical alteration. Um, so, um, the, and then the next slide is also a project that we worked together, but this time with Tom Lloyd of Pearson Lloyd. Um, it's a personal project for Tom. Uh, and again, it's a, a three-way collaboration on that. So we go to the next slide. So um, this is me and Tom Lloyd on the left and Luke Pearson on the right. Um, and I just wanted to say that, that, so they were the clients, but they were also co-designers on the project. So, <clears throat> and they were absolutely critical to the, obviously to the success of the project. They, um, they uh, it just so happens that Pete and I are talking about the project today, but really, they were all, all the decisions we're talking about were made collaboratively. And I think that's really what I want to say about the design team. There was a very successful collaboration between people who already had pre-existing working relationships. So I've worked up with Tom on several projects. Just so happens that Pete's worked with Luke also on a project recently. Um, and, and I think that, that collaborative process was essential to the success of this. Um, just by the by, there was a, um, yeah, also the other thing to say about that is that Tom and Luke were, the, the project has a long history before my involvement, many years, in fact, um, and uh, one of, and actually they did work with another architect on a, on a new build scheme, uh, which predates uh, this one by a couple of years, but uh, that was abandoned. And in fact, because of Pete's, relationship, pre-existing relationship with Tom and Luke, that he actually met them first to discuss the project. So I was going to hand over to Pete now to pick up the story from there. Yeah, thanks, Cass. Um, and I, I think that's, I think you're right. You know, relationships is a good place to start with a project like this because, um, you know, the way you interact, I mean, particularly with a retrofit, the possibilities of what you can do are very much uh, about a conversation, about uh, a trust with one another, uh, if you like, a shorthand to find design solutions. And, it, and in my experience, the best retrofit projects almost design themselves, if you like. Uh, so that relationship, that understanding, that shorthand to solutions, I think is really pertinent here and it was really influential, particularly as Cass, you were the contractor. You know, it's important that that sort of um, continuum from sort of concept right through to construction when you're dealing with old fabric, when you're making decisions uh, on the shop floor, so to speak, uh, that, that, that sort of understanding is really critical. So yeah, going back to the original building, the top slide shows, um, I, I met Tom and Luke on a rainy day on site 
just to have a look. They were thinking about rebuilding it, demolishing and rebuilding. And they had a bit, they wanted to just pause. They had a slight change of heart. And they were very conscious of the embodied carbon locked up in the um, existing building. And I think that was, they felt that was important to their practice and their ethos. And they wanted to just check, you know, whether there was any chance of saving it. And on first inspection, you know, it looks pretty unpromising, I've got to say, but when you go into the building, uh, we started to sort of uncover the bones of it and, um, and started that conversation about, well, perhaps this could be saved. The other thing, aside from relationships, that I think is really important in retrofit is an understanding of buildings. And uh, Cass has said that we've worked together on many projects and, and in small practice, you often, it, both architects and engineers, you often cut your teeth sort of altering existing properties. And if you work in London, you know, you're quite often altering old Victorian properties, chopping them around. And it gives you a very um, good insight into what is possible. But also, it's important to identify, you know, what can be saved and what can't be saved. And there's, there's a point at which you say, look, this, is, this has gone too far and needs to be demolished. Or in fact, we can work with this, we can repair. And, and that, that decision, um, I think, is very much about experience. Um, and that, that shouldn't be sort of uh, left unsaid, I think. So, um, well, in fact, if I go back just, just quickly on this top slide, the left hand two uh, beige colored blocks are actually in old Victorian workshops. And the right hand two bays, it's essentially split up into five bays. The right hand two bays are a late 80s, early 90s steel frame. The middle is an infill. And we quickly established that that had very little merit in terms of its fabric. And um, that was demolished. And the left hand Victorian bays and the right hand steel frame was refurbished. So this is a picture once uh, we'd taken the roof off of the Victorian parts. And you can sort of see when you take a part of a building like this, it's, it's sort of little more than a stack of sort of loose bricks. But with some careful work, with a good brick layer, with a bit of time, you can start to stitch the fabric back together. You can start to make alterations. Very often the timber in a building like this is decayed because it, it's let straight into the walls that are damp. So it's not uncommon to end up replacing a lot of timber, which we did here but the stock brick walls were repaired wherever possible. And in fact, this, this slide of the upstairs, you can see on the right hand side, there's a, a concrete ring beam that we cast around the top of the walls to sort of stabilize the holes, to sort of tie them together. It was quite a bulge in the street facade, which we also tied in with patches plates. But this ring beam was a, a structural device that in fact was expressed quite successfully, I think, in the, in the finished building. And then the right hand side, you know, the steel frame block infill, this is in many ways, it's got sort of less character, but from an engineering point of view, it's much more straightforward. You can sort of see what's there. And by back, an back analyzing this structure, uh, we can probably squeeze out more utility, more efficiency from the frame than was originally intended. We almost understand the structure better than the original designers because of our design tools. So in this side, we extended the roof, um, very much changed the facade, which you can see from the uh, pictures at the front. So that, that's a sort of overview of, you know, and it really this is building work. It's sort of um, stitching in steel, brick, timber into the existing building to sort of um, achieve the design intent. Um, but the, the, I'm, I'm mindful the talk is about carbon. And this is a snapshot of our in-house carbon calculator tool that we've developed. It's a combination of some guidance published by the Institute of Structural Engineers on how to calculate carbon. And it's also, um, it references a database of materials that's published by Bath University, um, the ICE database, um, which gives you carbon factors for all building materials. And by combining those two things, we can work out um, the uh, embodied carbon, embodied upfront carbon, i.e. to end of construction, and the embodied carbon to end of life um, of the structure. And so by taking, say, material quantities, so for example, you might say uh, a steel beam has a certain weight of steel, 
you apply the carbon factors and you get uh, an equivalent CO2, uh, kilograms of CO2 equivalent per square meter as a, as a sort of um, metric that you can compare with. So this is a useful diagram. It, again, it shows the, the left-hand side, the Victorian building, where we replaced a lot of timber and you can see that concrete rim beam at the top and the new roof. And the right-hand side where the majority of the work was extending the roof up and wrapping a brick facade around. And it's these green elements that attract the new carbon in a, in a retrofit like this. I mean, and one of the great savings with the project like this is that you save all the foundations. You know, concrete is very high in embodied energy and embodied carbon. And by not, by not demolishing, you save all that embodied carbon. A um, little bit more detail that comes out of the spreadsheet. These, um, these two diagrams give you a breakdown of components on the left and the total embodied carbon and materials on the right, the upfront embodied carbon. And you can see that on the, the left-hand side, the, um, the upfront embodied carbon, again, that's the carbon to uh, end of construction, we calculate to be 74 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per meter square. And that's a really, um, that's a really competitive figure. The, um, the REBA 2030 target for non-domestic buildings just for structure again, is a little shy of 160. So we're performing really well in a building like this. And then again, if you um, compare the retrofit scheme on the left here, 74 uh, kilograms of CO2 per square meter against what we estimated to be equivalent new build scheme, which was more like 220 kilograms of CO2 per square meter, you can see that the, the, um, the carbon uh, invested in the project is only a third of what would have happened uh, with a new build scheme. So that's really important and that's and that's something to be very sort of aware of in a retrofit scheme. And I mean that I've been very much talking about structural carbon. There's obviously um, in-use carbon and uh, Cass I don't know if you want to talk a bit about yeah uh, talk a bit about that and and the systems. Yeah, so um, we achieved uh, annual emissions of 24 kilograms of carbon per square meter. And we did that by um, using um, very high insulation in places as much as we could, uh, low voltage fittings, very good air tightness and a PV array. But actually in terms of the energy consumption of the, the in use, we were very concerned with the user comfort. Um, and we tried to, um, or designed the building in order to um, maximize passive user comfort. So natural ventilation, north facing glazing largely and solar, uh, solar shading on any, the small number of south facing windows, exposed masonry walls and floors. <clears throat> uh, and in order that to avoid uh, any kind of mechanical um, uh, uh, using ventilation requirements for, to prevent overheating. Um, <clears throat> but I think it's, um, it's fair to say that uh, sustainability was, was not the only driving factor in the project. We have the next slide, Pete. So um, one of the things that came out of the calculations was to set that central piece that you can see with the concrete. Um, there's, there's some exposed concrete in there. Um, and the, um, if you go to the next slide, you can see in this chart here, <coughs> Excuse me. That the the um, that that um, tower on the left is the uh, embodied carbon in the central section of the building, and the yellow is the concrete. Um, so it's quite a big chunk of it. Uh, so we, we you know in terms of the back analysis of the of the project, we were we were sort of trying to look at things that we might have done differently, and would we do it again? But I've got to bear in mind that that yellow. Um, chunk does include the footings and the foundations so that would have been necessary anyway because it's a sex, essentially a new build section but there is some of it which is expressed the concrete so we we were having a discussion Pete and I about whether that would be something that we'd do again um, if we have the next slide so you can see the view and then perhaps the next one after that yeah so this is a view of that 
there's a sort of a, a port, an a external porch area, and we've expressed some concrete in the area. Um, it's actually one of the, it does have a stru structural function, and uh, but, but moreover, an architectural one, um, which is to do with expressing the bridge between the two blocks. Um, and uh, yeah, so if we were just look, it's only a relatively minor element, but we were interested to sort of focus in on how we might have done it differently. Um, Pete, have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, I think um, in terms of this talk and in terms of the project, the, the project's very successful in terms of carbon and it's been really well received and it was a real pleasure to work on. You know, it was a really exciting project. But I think in terms of this talk and in terms of a sort of the debate about retrofit and carbon, what's, what's interesting to me is how uh, sort of doing the math, so to speak, running the numbers of the carbon can shine a light on the design process and can start to influence the design process. I mean, in this project, we actually did the carbon calculations towards the end of the project. Obviously, we were aware that carbon is high, uh, sorry, concrete is high in carbon. Uh, but in the link, we made a decision to use it because we felt we were using it efficiently. You know, it was useful in terms of, in terms of this shot, the, the, the terrace, which is good in concrete because it takes a lot of high load and it's exposed to weather. Um, it cantilevers over to the flank wall, so it actually relieves load from the Victorian structure. But it's also expressed, you know, I feel like we're sort of, um, we're maximising the utility of that concrete. We're using it efficiently structurally we're exposing it so it gives a sort of architectural expression and, and we're using it consciously, you know, but the debate about um, whether, uh, you, you know, what materials we should be building in, I think is really interesting. And it's only by putting the numbers to them that you can discuss it with any accuracy. I mean, so if I could chip in on that, the, it's, to me, it's about knowing what you're doing and being aware of it. So if you want to, we, we having having um, developed for ourselves some leeway in saving all of that other concrete in, in the rest of the building, eighty percent of the footings were reused. Um, we we I think we were sort of earned an opportunity to to express something like this in a small area. But but again, we we're sort of focusing in on what we could have done better, perhaps. And it's a discussion about whether we would do that again. Um, how yeah, do I, think I, I think that's the same with any project, you know, evaluating at the end is, is a really interesting thing to do. You know, you'd always do some things differently, but, um, but, but just as a, I suppose as a bookend to that, the, the potential for the measurement of carbon to, make, carbon to influence design and to influence what we perceive of as good design, I think is really interesting. You know. I'm going to hop back in, even though I can't see myself, I think I, I can be seen. So I'm going to say a ma massive thank you to Peter and Cass. And one thing that came across in that great talk, and thank you both so much, actually is the kind of beautiful, almost poetic description of the stitching of the building back together and the sort of materiality. You talked, Peter, about stitching the steel, brick and timber together, which I think is the beauty of, of retrofit and retrofit is rightly being seen as a really important tool in reducing carbon emissions. And this project um, in particular has been rightly um, awarded the AJ Retrofit Award. And I think AJ are, should also be sort of thanked for their Retro First campaign, which is really getting the discussion going. I wanted to ask actually Cass about having the in-house construction team does seem a really important part of this project. And that sort of very hands-on approach to materials and to mm. reusing materials. So how, how did that work in this project? It must make it much easier to sort of have that hands-on approach. Um, I, yeah, in some ways, um, I think that it helped because of with an existing building, inevitably things crop up your um, working on it um, and they, it, it meant that we could be very uh, reactive. Uh, we, there's a sort of short shortcut to the design solutions that we wouldn't have to, you know, I could make a snap decision about any cost implication or not, or just decide to, to do it. Um, you know, so, uh, Tom 
um, Lloyd was on site every day virtually as well. I'd, I would be on site every day. Um, so yeah, I think, it, I think it was really, really, I would say it's critical to the success of this actually. It really feels like, to me, to me I always think that there's a sort of slightly arbitrary line between architect and builder, that traditionally there was a much more fluid process. Mm. And I really, really enjoy that fluidity. So the design continues onto, onto the site. It feels much more natural with a project like this. With a new build, I suppose it's much easier to draw it all in advance. Yeah. And Peter, you, you spoke about the carbon calculator and how that would be used ideally sort of upfront can you see that that's something that's going to become more and more important in projects, especially projects like these? Yeah, I mean, completely. I mean, now we have that resource. And in fact, when we started this project, uh, I think we started right at the end of 2018, so it's two and a half years ago. It's actually quite a rapid project, but our capability has massively changed in the last two years and our sensibility. So now within the practice here at concept design stage, it's a, it's a matter of procedure that we do a carbon study on different on different solutions, you know, whereby we would normally, uh, or in the past, we would have looked for cost effectiveness or sort of um, contribution to architecture or any any of those things. You know, carbon is right there from the start now, and uh, I think that's that's obviously it's necessary, and I think it will become commonplace. And it, and it's actually it's actually very stimulating, you know, of that just that slight change in attitude. Has, has stimulated a lot of debate, a lot of conversation, and a lot of sort of re-energized um, enthusiasm. Yes, which seems, a, I mean, picking up on what Cash just said about that sort of hands-on approach as well of the, you know, the construction which would have been there in the past, that sort of knowledge of material, and then that sort of married to the technology and the, the advances in technology that allows your carbon calculator to to look at the very beginning of a project to yeah. see what the impact is. It's very exciting actually and feels quite a powerful tool in moving forwards. Um, I've got a few questions here. Uh, someone asks, what structural surveys did you undertake to ensure existing structure could take the new loads? That seems quite important. Um, there's, a, there's obviously a visual survey, get to know the building, understand its chronology. It's quite important to sort of picture what was done first, what was done, because you, you gain an understanding. And a visual survey just in terms of verticality and, and you just soak, you know, spending time with the building. And then we did um, site investigation. So trial pitting, in situ strength testing of the soil to check how uh, good the foundations were. And there were a range of different foundations we found on site. And quite often you don't know everything. You have to take a, you know, make a judgment. And then uh, going back to the design relationships, you know, when you unpick a building, you are, you always find surprising, you know, a surprise in the fabric. Something as it gets uncovered, you have to go to site. You have to make a decision on site together. So it's it's a it's a sort of prescriptive and iterative process. And someone is asking if there's an app for the carbon calculator. <laughs> Maybe that's a way off, but that just seems like it would be so useful. There is, um, there's not an app for your phone. That would be great, wouldn't it? I mean, we, was, <laughs> we spent a lot of time just making a spreadsheet. If anyone's interested yes. in our carbon calculator, they can send us an email and we've issued it to lots of people already free. We sort of feel its influence is much better shared than sort of retained. If you go to our website, you can find a link there. You send an email to carbon calculator at Structure Workshop, we'll send you the spreadsheet. That's brilliant, thank you. And Kathy is asking, I might just have to read her question actually, a question for Peter. Has it been straightforward justifying an extended design life for the whole project, including both the existing structures integrated with the new structures? What is the theoretical design life? And I guess that is a really important part of, of retrofit, isn't it? Working out, you know, what your design life will be. Yeah, I, I might answer that if I may. You yeah. may. We, we, I mean, it, it's, it depends how well it's looked after, but there's a definitely took a very, um, uh, with the clients, a very um, uh, uh, approach of using robust details. Um, so the, uh, it, the, the potential for it to be hundreds of years if it's um, renewed, but the working, working period is about 60 years in the short term, uh, relatively short term, so. 
Um, it's all to do with uh, maintenance, to do with certain elements lasting longer than others. The fundamentals of it could, could go on for hundreds of years. Great. Well, that gives me time to visit then. <laughs> <laughs> I want to take this opportunity to, to thank you both so much. Um, it's a beautiful project and I think a sort of love of it comes across. And I think what better way of preserving so the, the building, but also sort of not being precious and, and having that sort of central section. And I think also the sort of materials use is something that comes across very clearly that concrete isn't necessarily a bad thing. If you use it judiciously, it can be a really important part of a retrofit project. And I think that is something for us at the building center. You know, we started life 90 years ago this year as a materials library. And I think that sort of resurgence of interest in materials use is, is very, very important and sort of very close to our hearts here at the Building Centre. So thank you both again, Cass and Peter. And um, thank you all for watching in your homes and offices. Uh, all of the talks are uploaded to our YouTube channel. Give us a follow on Instagram and Twitter to see what we've got coming up next. Um, looking forward to seeing everybody in real life. Yeah, thanks, Cass. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. Thanks, Goodbye. Thank Goodbye. All the best. All the best.